Whether we are there or not, ITSP Magazine still gets the best stories. Plenty of conferences and events spark our curiosity and allow us to start conversations with some of the world's brightest minds. In person or virtually, Sean Martin and Marco Cipelli go on location and sit down with them at the intersection of technology, cybersecurity, and society. Together, we discover what the synergy of these three elements means for the future of humanity. Right. Volume is good. <laughs> Go for it. <laughs> I know. Really loud. Is it really loud? Yeah. He's really loud. The, the Italian's really loud. <laughs> yeah, are you used to that with me? I am used to that. And, You've been quite, uh, you can quiet though. I know. The other, the other side of the camera is talking. And, uh, getting louder and louder. I know. He's getting, he could probably hear him on our mics all the way. <laughs> but uh, here, here we are. Um, we're recording. Don't mess with this, huh? There he is. Keep going. All right, I'm seeing what you're up to. So, Francesco. Marco. Here sorry. we are, my friend. We, what was it, last year we, uh, we saw last each year other we, here? Yeah, we came about yeah. and we crossed but here. I know. And now we're on the other side of the camera. I know. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So we're at uh, Info Security Europe. You can probably see the sign as Marco shifts it around here. Um, and you have a cool spot inside, I do have to say. Yeah. You got a nice uh, nice booth there, and the booth is busy, so you have some good conversations there. So we're going to get the uh, the origin story in Phoenix and uh, all the cool stuff you're doing, the announcements you have yeah. already in place, some that are coming, that I'm getting under embargo. You're going to hear about it <laughs> tomorrow when this comes out. But uh, Francesca, it's always good to see you, man, and I'm glad to see you're doing well and all the fun stuff you're doing. But let's... Uh, Let's start with, well, let's start with you first. Uh, maybe a couple words about some of the stuff you've been up to in the past that uh, led you up to today. Yeah, no, thank you. And it's always a pleasure to yeah. talk to you guys. Um, it's been quite a while in the making this and Phoenix and what we built. Uh, and I always pride myself to focus on helping engineering not burn out mm. and that was my mission from the day one when we started phoenix as a, almost an internal project in hsbc right. and i had my team burning out on a consistent basis and we just sat down together and said look it can't be that the whole world need to rely around millions of vulnerabilities and we get the worst part of it and by discussing about the problem we quickly realized that it was a communication problem on mm -hmm. one end and a prioritization problem. When we were discussing with the engineers, the knee-jerk reaction was, please don't sell me more vulnerability mm -hmm. stuff to fix because, of course, everybody has their day job. Right. And if we came to us... You only fix so much, Francesca. Exactly, <laughs> but it wasn't even in their job spec. Right. Like, the challenge was, okay, fix vulnerability in your spare time. Why should you do it? Why should you focus on fixing vulnerability? It's not a really good selling point. Oh, by the way, on this evening, you're gonna spend another couple of hours fixing vulnerability and not seeing your family. Right. And of course, we need to make it important for the business, but by trying to communicate to business executive, oh look, you have this business critical system that has critical vulnerability exploitable in X, Y, and Z by this threat actor, you already lost them at word number 10. Right. So we needed a way to translate business executive language to engineering, to security, and we found that that was the biggest language gap. Mm. That was the biggest challenge that we had because not engineer didn't want to just push us back. It didn't, they didn't have security in their agenda. And even when security was in their agenda, it was a lip service. It was like, we shall be more secure. Right. From an engineer perspective, it's like, how many story points does it equate to? It's like five story points, ten right. story points. Like, and do they even know how to write those stories? No. For the security, exactly. No, exactly. <laughs> and, and there was a massive language gap and this connection gap between yeah. the expectation from an executive perspective into engineering practice. Like, engineer works in list. Security works in risk. Mm -hmm. And the business works in risk. There is a massive disconnect in that. You need to translate risk objective and target into action for engineers. Yeah. 
and that's what we build with Phoenix. On the early, early version of Phoenix, we help engineers just focusing on this, and that didn't require us security team to get involved with engineers because it didn't require any more telling engineers look you need to focus on this particular list of stuff the system was doing that for us what we started working is can we do this even smarter can we work systemically about like similar to what CISA has done like memory safe language of this particular set and category of vulnerability is more interesting because as I was talking in the talk this morning these are more in the attack surface. Right? Uh, Thirteen percent or fourteen percent of the MVD is on one specific category of vulnerability that can e can either be remote code execution, buffer overflow, or memory corruption. So if you focus on those, right. chances are that you will focus on the same stuff that the attacker will focus because they think like a business. Yeah, they think like I need to generate a piece of code that's going to attack the majority of the installation base and that's usually is the known the known folks Microsoft Oracle and so on so and specific attack method and pattern like remote code execution cross-site scripting and so on those are the ones that are easy to automate so if you think like an attacker as a security you can deliver a massive a massive benefit to the business and you're gonna be loved by engineers right yeah, because all of a sudden you're not showing up to a stand-up meeting and saying, look, can you please fix 50 vulnerabilities? Like, if you fix this, this, and this, or if you focus on this library, you maximize your risk reduction. They're gonna love you, because first of all, you're giving them an objective, yep. and an actionable objective, and something that they can focus on and compete on. So talk to me about what they see there, because it, maybe a comparison to what they get normally working with more one or more scanners, right, the different types, versus what you get with Phoenix in terms of here's the high impact, you might fix something here that's critical, maybe don't need to fix it here because it's not yeah. necessarily a, a high, high, I don't know, say value app or whatever, but I guess paint, paint that picture for the engineer's security team so they can visualize what you do there. Cause I think yeah, that's, that's and usually when you work with scanner, that's your first approach or like right. it's a more reactive and that's what we wrote in the book. Like the first stuff that you do is you scan, you get a list of problems. And that's fine when you have one scanner on one problem. That can be libraries, that can be your code, that can be your infrastructure. But then you start adding, okay, now we need to scan for misconfiguration. Right. Misconfiguration in production or where you run your code and misconfiguration on the way you build your code. Okay, now you have three sources. Then you now add you SCA. Deliver. Yeah. But now you add SCA. Yeah. So composition analysis. And now you have five sources. Right. And now you have composition analysis on your container. Now you have six sources. And now you add dust. But dust on your pipeline or dust externally. Now you're eight sources. And so on and so on. Right. So understanding fundamentally this as an engineer it's complicated and then on top of that you expect engineers to go and pick up their own project from this list and sometimes they're massive they're 3,000 10,000 vulnerabilities like go and find what belongs to you in that particular things and then reverse engineers in that list if that actually you need to fix in that particular instance or you need to fix it in a particular piece of code that is deployed somewhere like that takes nine hours to understand a specific problem and then you need to go and fix it like nobody want to do it so what and we what's the fix the fix is actually <laughs> phoenix <laughs> no i'm saying what for each for each vulnerability what's the right fix exactly but that's yeah. that's what we focus on on phoenix we are what we call an actionable aspm because we focus more on looking at the fix that deliver the biggest risk reduction yeah. but not in general but for the application that are deployed in production for your particular team so it's a very narrow down list of vulnerability yeah. that are actionable and then we also inform you from a risk perspective what is fixable exploitable and convert all of that into an automated risk formula that you can also customize because some business say for me it's particularly important where things are or for me it's particularly important where exploits are if something is fixable so you can customize it as business because every business has a different risk perception and tolerance 
But then from an engineer perspective, they get a list of things that is finite and to fix on a week-to-week -week basis right. and they can go crack on and fix it in line with the expectation of the executive. So as a CISO, you can say, I want to be at this risk level or I want to be at this risk level. And as a CISO, you can understand how many hours are that equate? How many work hours are that equate from an engineering perspective? Am I going to achieve that in a quarter or in six months? Right. So, and talk to me about, because oftentimes it isn't <coughs> just one fix, right? So there could be multiple ways. It could be an upgrade a library. It could be write a new line of code. It could be write new lines of code, multiple lines of code. It could be you have a different configuration you can play, which will mitigate, right. or you might have some other compensating controls. So how much how much of that can you present to the team? Does it always have to be engineering as well? Or no, it can be a mix between GLC, engineering, yeah. other folks, because right now we rely heavily on engineers because only them can understand this world of vulnerability. But if you start talking about risk and um, what are the factors that from a risk perspective um, influence the scoring, then everybody can say, look, I have this compensating control in my application. Can I reduce systemically this particular set of risks? That's a GRC function. Yeah. And I haven't talked about vulnerability. So you can kind of democratize vulnerability assessment management and risk management across your whole organization and as well shorten the skill gap that currently we have because we don't have enough engineers to cover all of this. No security engineers. So with this you can kind of upscale, with Phoenix you can upscale your workforce to think about risk-based approach and hence um, cover more with less people or with the same amount of people that you have and prevent burnout because you automate a lot of the decision time that normally takes you hours. With Phoenix it takes you, I mean the best case we reduce to 10 minutes to decide if you need to fix and where you need to fix specific things. And then we obsess with fix. Because as you rightfully say, Marco, Sean, <laughs> I, see Marco. You. I see you guys are a single entity. <laughs> Sean, um, as you rightfully said, there is a path to do I fix in this particular thing or do I fix in the library. We actually correlate and contextualize where things are so that we can see you have this problem here, but actually you built it with this particular infrastructure as a code. So go and fix the infrastructure as a code yeah. file instead of focusing on operation. Right. Or this particular container that is deployed 50 yeah, touch times, many, touch many, fix, yeah. and then you can deploy this in particular, this build file for this particular container. Yeah. So that's the stuff that we focus with Phoenix to actually maximize risk reduction based on vulnerability pattern of fix. Yeah. I don't know the name, but I think you just you just closed a new client, which is cool. So tell me, tell me uh, what some of the outcomes are for some of your customers. What, what's the feedback you're getting? Is it clearly it's to make life easier for the engineering, bring in both better collaboration and, and and experience and connection between security application security and operational security and engineering. So what's some of the feedback you're getting? So one of the good feedback that we got, for example, one of the largest uh, banking clients that we have, uh, ClearBank, we got into a state where they have in real time up to date your asset inventory and the attribution. So which team actually is maintaining what from an operational perspective, so from a runtime perspective and from an application security perspective. So from a team perspective, they can jump on Phoenix on a weekly basis, schedule the workload and see the impact on the wake after of the things that they fix and if they're making progress or not. Now, from a security perspective, they saw that specific team weren't making a huge dent because they had to maintain a lot of vulnerability. And hence, they start focusing on, look, if you fix on this particular campaign of vulnerability, if you fix on this particular pattern of vulnerability, then you're gonna maximize your risk reduction. So it's making it informed risk-based decision, but also right. helping security team engaging with engineering team in a more practical and proactive way that they leave a good feeling results yeah. because nobody want to go home and say I didn't manage to make a dent in my whole organization and that's 90% of security yeah. work yeah. basically I'm gonna tell them this stuff let's um, <laughs> <laughs> so I one thing that I noticed I, I, I follow you Closely, closely. Very close. Uh, I'll, no, look, I'll, I'll look myself <laughs> in the back tomorrow. 
No, but I do. I do see. I do see what's going on, and I. It's, it, I'm always thrilled to see that you continue to grow. And what I notice is a lot of partnerships. Now, granted, you, you're working with a lot of scanners and other feeds sources to inform you, and which inform your engineers and security teams. Talk to me about some of the partnerships you have. I think you just announced another one. Recently. Yeah. So uh, this year, we recognize that what we're really good at is. You know, troubleshooting, looking at the vulnerability source data. So we have 150,000 vulnerability findings that then we convert in 10,000 verified exploit. Now, if you want to take that to the next degree, because as a platform, we rely heavily on weaponization, exploitation, and so on, to actually inform our risk, or we wanted to offer our clients the next level of threat intelligence, because maybe you want to deploy a Yara rule, maybe you want to uh, understand which threat actors is actually using particular vulnerability. So we decided to partner up and announce the partnership today with Boomcheck so that you can have their own threat intelligence vulnerability data directly in the platform and be flagged if a particular vulnerability is exploited, not exploited, weaponizable, together with our threat intelligence. So with a minimal spend, you get an enormous amount of vulnerability, almost the whole entire world of vulnerability right. exploitation uh, at a single click. And all of that automated in the decision-making uh, uh, process that Phoenix operates on together with the recently announced patented four-dimensional risk formula that enable us to bring a lot of the intelligence and the context, uh, the probability of exploitation, how bad the vulnerability is, and which threat actor are looking at a particular vulnerability into a single risk formula that you can make decision on. Um, but also give you all of these factors. So one of the things that our clients love is the fact that we're transparent. We tell you exactly right. this particular vulnerability is exploitable and then it's corroborated by this particular evidence and it's not just a single number that you need to believe it or right. not. We nice actually black tell, box. <laughs> exactly. We're an engineering we're an engineering community. Yeah. So we tell you this is particularly vulnerable because of A, B and C, because the uh, vulnerability is on a system that is externally facing up to this percentage is critical, has X amount of weaponization uh, in the wild and so on. So helps you making risk-based informed decision, but also shorten up the amount of time security team need to spend with engineering. If you give them all that data up front and all that context up front. And otherwise, they're, they're doing that research to- Correct. Right, to understand it and to validate it and have the understanding of what to do. Yeah. So what else, you have some other stuff you're announcing. Yes, so the book is actually one of the recent yes. and most Proud publication. Uh, Show the camera the book. It's been <laughs> it's been a year in the making, so yeah. <laughs> I thought it would have been taken much less. And it's an evolution on the um, SLA uh, risk-based decision process that we previously published. On this one, we decided to do something slightly different. So we decided to bring both vulnerability management folks, okay. so like Chris Yu and Shinta, and application security team to actually bring things together. Um, and it was a really difficult project <laughs> because application security folks things in a very different way from vulnerability management people. But right now the service is one, so we decided why not bring all of these minds together into one. And this is basically a lot of the compounds, uh, data, talks, and intelligence that we all have done over the years together with the vulnerability. Uh, exploitation and the process that Phoenix relies on as well. Uh, that is a risk-based approach. Again, more transparency. Yeah, absolutely. How this stuff works. But we, it's Phoenix has been a product born from the community for the community, right. and we do a lot for the community because we want. Ultimately, we build a product to actually simplify decision making times and give back the time that engineers needs and security engineers needs to actually do what matters most not just open jira ticket writing and troubleshooting but actually having the effect and the most effective impact on the organization do you see mbos management by objectives changing <laughs> a little bit yeah. i see i see a little bit the okr changing into more objective base i've seen security targets simple security target being translated into engineering function has seen the shift from pure SLA into instead of looking at let's fix all the critical let's fix all the critical risk 
and let's fix all the critical risk on the application that are in production. So I've seen a transition from knee-jerk reaction, we have this exploit, to I have a log for J, on which system do we have, or I have a spring for shell, I look at my spawn library and then am I affected by it or not. So we enable security with confidence. Yeah. And without chaos. <laughs> without chaos. <laughs> if you're trying to do oil the ocean, patching everything. I mean, it's you can, easy. it's just going to take gonna you a be long hard. time. Our new team's going to burn up. And by the time you actually start, stop fixing, yeah, new things have popped out. Exactly. Uh, and probably somebody has figured out that that particular vulnerability that you haven't fixed because you, you focus right, on focusing fixing on the back end of the cafeteria log for j and they're going to get in from yeah. that place. And then from a management perspective, they say, we spend so much in vulnerability analysis, why can't we be secure? Because it's a matter of priority. All right, you got to take action on what you find. Again, it's not just enough to find it. And uh, you don't want to burn out in the process. And we, so. we don't have enough people even to burn I them know. out. I know. Well, Francesco, it's been great chatting with you. Hopefully uh, you get some folks to connect with you and here at the show and, and uh, beyond the show. Yes. And we'll, I'll see you in Lisbon. See you in Lisbon. For a uh, little AppSec Global. <laughs> great to speak and, to you. Uh, yeah, it's been fun. Always a pleasure, Francesco. Keep Great to see you in London. Then. I know. It's good to see you. Thanks, everybody. everybody. Goodbye. Connect with Francesco and uh, the Phoenix team. And uh, see download you the, the book. One. Get the book as well. <laughs> Stay safe out there. Bye. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Sean and Marco's on location event coverage conversations. Please take a moment to give the show a good rating and leave a comment. Remember to share this podcast with your friends, family, and colleagues. Come back for more conversations and follow Sean Martin and Marco Cipelli as they continue their journey toward redefining cybersecurity and society.